Hello, everybody. Welcome again to our virtual homesteading series. We're so excited you're here. My name is Rianne. I work for 21 Acres as the administrative assistant, and we're really grateful you could spend some time with us for this homesteading series, planning your winter garden now. Greens all winter long. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so thank you as always to Alexia, our homesteading educator today for teaching us. Um, today and throughout the last year, Alexia is with Hawthorne Farm, an incredible homestead farm um, up in, here in Woodenville, Washington. And today Alexia is joining us from California, which is awesome. Um, and we are very excited again to be working with them. We've learned through the last year a variety of topics that relate to sustainable living from seed to harvest, cooking to fermentation, rabbit and how to process rabbit. Um, so many topics. If you're interested, please check out our virtual learning page. Um, yeah, uh, Alexia of Hawthorne Farm has some awesome educational programs at their farm. I encourage you to check them out and I will link their information in the chat. So I'd like to give a land acknowledgement before we begin. 21 Acres and Hawthorne Farm are both located in Woodenville, Washington, and we are on the ancestral lands of indigenous nations, including the Stiligwamish tribe, the Duwamish, and the Coast Salish peoples. We acknowledge these nations as the original stewards of this land, and we honor both the land itself and the Coast Salish people, past and present. And we appreciate you taking time to honor this land with us and to learn more about how we're trying to steward this land for future generations. Um, so yeah, we appreciate you joining and we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. Here's Alexia. All right, well, hello everybody. And I will jump into attempting to share my screen here uh, to see if that is going to work. Slightly new technology in a slightly new place for me, but I tested it out, um, attempted to test it out and it seemed to work. Yay. So, okay, here we go. We see it. Oh, that's such a great picture. <laughs> okay. You can see my winter gardening secrets to happiness. And that is me, an ecstatic winter gardener uh, there. It is really great to spread the gardening efforts out over the year. And I really love to eat pretty much every day of the year. What catapulted me, what launched me, what like bulldozed me into gardening in the wintertime was this year that myself and my husband Daniel spent in 2017 eating all hand harvested food. If it didn't come directly from the earth through our hands or somebody we knew who gave it to us, then we didn't eat it. And so the grocery store wasn't an option. We spent six years preparing for that entire year of challenge, learning what we could eat when, what would store well when, when we needed to plant these things, and how we could get fresh greens throughout the entire season. Daniel's a big salad eater. I can't take credit for like going out and making myself a big salad, um, but I will say that I 100% feel better when I am eating lots of fresh food throughout the entire year. So um, it's just totally worth it. And I want to say a big hello to all the folks I know and folks who have been through Hawthorne Farm who are signing up for this call. It's great to see your names and great to all the folks who are just trickling in from other places. I don't know how well all these practices and tips will work for you. This is just what works in my garden and it is not even close to everything there is to know about winter gardening. My main hope is to just get you jazzed about trying, about experimenting. I experiment every year with, what about these varieties of cabbage? What about this lettuce? What if I put a little you know, plastic tote upside down over this one plant and see what happens? So this is to say you can probably grow more through the winter than you think you can. And 
I'm going to be putting out a lot of information and a lot of pictures from our farm today, but you don't have to remember it all. You can also just go get yourself a territorial seed catalog, especially their winter edition. And it has handy things like here's when you plant, you know, here's a whole chart of when you plant which vegetable and when you can harvest it, you know, in general for a Pacific Northwest kind of climate. So all this advice is general until you put it to the test in your garden. So let me know what you find. Other books like the Winter Harvest Handbook, and I'll give a whole resource list at the end. But just to say you don't have to remember everything right now, there's a lot of great information to refer to out there as well. So the virtue of this, uh, this webinar here is that you can ask questions. You can say, hey, do you think this would work? Or, you know, here's something I've tried. You can fill us all in on those questions. So winter gardening. Let's see. Okay, so the standard American garden cycle, the way it works across a lot of the country is you run out to the garden store, like when those warm days of spring hit, you just can't help yourself. You just need plants. You run out and you buy a bunch of garden starts that they, I mean, hooray for the nurseries, et cetera, but they're not selling those to you so that you can grow the most amazing food possible necessarily. They're selling them to you because it's a great way to make money, which is also perfectly fine, but you should just know that before you go buy. I've seen a lot of veggie starts in the stores and a lot of people buying veggie starts that are never going to do well for them because of the variety, because of the timing. You know, if you buy lettuce that's starting to send up a flower stalk, that's not going to be an edible head of lettuce for you. Um, so I just want you, any novice gardeners here, to not get swayed by just buying a whole bunch of veggie starts. We did a whole class a few months ago about starting your own veggies from seeds. So I'd refer you to that for a little pep talk on starting your own. Anyhow, you don't have to do it this way. You don't have to like plant all green beans and zucchini and have more of everything than you can eat in August and go around leaving zucchini in people's unlocked cars and then buy little plastic boxes of kale from California all winter. Um, you probably live in a place where, like I said, you can grow more food than you think you can through the winter. And you do that through timing. You do that through some kind of covering for some plants. Um, and you do that through choosing the right plants. Anyhow, let's find out more about this better way. I mean, come on, doesn't this look great? Look at these beauties. Uh, and the cabbages are awesome too. So what I'm talking about for this is planting in the late spring through the late summer. So a lot of people just want to plant everything in spring. I'm saying, whoa, 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 Nelly, hold yourself back. Save a little space in your garden for the kale, for the daikon radishes that you plant in August, for the kohlrabi, for garlic, for things that you're going to be tending over the course of the year so that you can eat over the course of the year. And, you know, easy entry points are things like kale, kohlrabi, and garlic. Those have been super easy for me. Slightly trickier might be cabbage. Onions are definitely tricky, but possible. You can see from those cabbages, I'm giving them a lot of space. So if you're somebody who's gardening in a container <laughs> on your patio, you can grow a lot of amazing herbs and greens for the winter, but just one of those cabbages would like take up your entire planter box, you know, if they have two or three feet in all directions. So I'm, I'll be tossing out my ideas. You're just going to have to make them work for your space. In the Pacific Northwest, we have very dry summers. Cabbage and broccoli and all these other moisture, cool loving plants don't really love to germinate in super warm soil. So that's part of the challenge of getting your summer garden going, you know, or, or planting your little tiny cute seedlings in the summer in order to eat in the winter. You're going to need to fuss over those babies a little bit, but it doesn't take too much fussing to grow a huge, juicy, crunchy, sweet head of cabbage. So I've found that it pretty much pays off. Any comments or thoughts right off the bat here? I've seen a couple of things. 
that was just me sharing how my new goal in life is to see if I can grow a pillow sized cabbage because yeah. it looks absolutely fantastic. And all of the great foods that come out of that beautiful, beautiful plant. I'm just, I'm very excited. Cabbage <laughs> yeah. is a good staple. Okay. So share yeah. in the chat and, um, and yeah, we'll, we'll siphon them. Perfect. Um, so like I said, I really was gardening with this focus, am gardening with this focus of I have got to eat every day of the year. So there are a few ways to do that. Several different overlapping strategies with something as important as eating. I want multiple ways of making that happen. So one way is preserving. And we've done some great classes on that. I can a whole bunch of tomatoes. I dry a whole bunch of tomatoes dry a whole bunch of fruit and herbs, different things where it makes sense to dry those. And then we eat that bounty for the whole year. You can also do fall planting for spring harvest. Again, you know, I plant something and then however much longer later, I harvest it. And so I have to keep planting and harvesting, planting and harvesting in these overlapping waves. And to illustrate that fall planting principle, just to put another cool idea out there, our farm mate Marley there is sitting in the greenhouse surrounded by little seedlings, your young plants that were planted at the end of October when we took all the tomatoes out of that greenhouse. We just put down seeds for lettuces, for mustard greens, for spinach, for arugula, for mizuna greens. We put those in in October. And they're tiny by, in, you know, in February, by the time she's, we're taking this picture, they're small but harvestable. But in another few weeks, they were like knee high and we were eating all the steamed mustard greens we possibly could well before anybody else's gardens were up. So if you have a place where you can grow some stuff under cover and let it under over winter, you get a huge jump start on the season. You know, people don't usually think of planting lettuce in October, but it can work if you just give it a little cover, even if that's as simple as like a clear plastic, you know, a clear plastic bin upside down over it or, you know, potlucks or parties or the clear plastic cake top trays. I'm like, I put those over little plants in the garden and I managed to keep them alive through the winter when I couldn't otherwise. I'm like, you know, I'll put them in the recycling once they're totally done for the plants, but they might as well do another tour of duty uh, in the garden, protecting plants over the winter. That is brilliant. And I actually, if you don't mind, I do have a question about that. Yeah. If we have this really um, kind of sunny area on our house. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have a great like soil situation. So I, I usually use uh, containers there. Mm -hmm. If I had, you know, like a, a larger size container um, that was full of soil and, and I started lettuce there and just kind of put my, my uh, cake cover over because I do have them also mm -hmm. laying, like hiding, waiting to be used for something awesome like this, that, um, that could work to overwinter everything. It, does it depend on how deep the soil gets in that container yes mm -hmm. <laughs> it's definitely like you know the kind of it depends thing um mm -hmm. because the the little cover is kind of storing residual heat from the soil underneath so yes a raised bed will warm up faster but also cool down faster i'd say it's worth a try for sure yeah yeah so. thank you yeah Okay, what we're going to be talking about mostly here is summer planting for winter harvest. I try to make these timely, so I'm like, it's June, it is prime time to plant a bunch of seeds that will grow into plants that you can eat in November, December, January, February. So summer planting for winter harvest. That's what I'm going to talk about most so that you can harvest an amazing salad every day of the year. Like I said, fresh veggies are, are where it's at. Okay, so photographic examples here. Uh, this, the big picture on the left is a whole big row of frilly kale right down the middle of our garlic patch. So there's a little room on either side of the garlic patch. And I had a bunch of little leftover kale starts from my farm stand and I just plunked them right in. So these are all the little like poor reject kales. 
but they did awesome. And we ate them for months. I mean, months and months. We were just grazing down this kale patch. When the kale flowered, we ate that. As we harvested the garlic in uh, July, primarily, we put in little cabbage starts. And pretty soon, you know, by the end of August, we had a huge patch of cabbage with kale running down the middle of it. So it didn't take extra space. Like I didn't need double the garlic space. I could just take out the garlic as it became ready, plunk in my cabbage starts. And Marley there on the right, this was our whole like February garden <laughs> shoot, uh, photo shoot. She's by some snow covered kale and behind her is a little inconspicuous row of daikon radish leaves. Has anybody here eaten daikon? Ever tried daikon radish? You probably, I, this has been one of my new favorites for sure. You want some daikon radish. Uh, we plant them in August and then they have these enormous, sweet, crunchy roots underground. I've tested several different varieties. Um, so I would say mess around with the varieties that work best for you. But we were digging up big, crunchy, sweet daikon radishes and we would grate them into a salad with carrots and beets and some chopped up kale and some you know, pomegranate seeds if a neighbor gave us a pomegranate and we would just have a fantastic wintertime salad. So you can eat a fresh salad every day of the year. It just might not be the exact same salad. They're gonna be pretty different. Uh, so these were fantastic and we were eating them up through March. What happens in March? Anybody? Why could, why did we need to eat them by about March? Hmm. I'm going to guess it started to get warm, too warm. <laughs> and day length, oh. it, because in March, the day length changes really fast, especially for us way up at the higher latitudes, the day length changes. And a lot of plants, including a lot of plants in the mustard family, like radishes, like kale, like broccoli, like cabbages, when, in, when they sense the days getting longer, during their second year of growth, they're like, okay, I am done being a vegetable. I am going to be a flower now. I need to make seeds and then die. Uh, so if we didn't eat all the daikon radish, we're like, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just save the daikon radish until May. Well, by May, those radishes send up a big old flower stalk. They use all the energy in their roots to send up the flower stalk. So all of a sudden you can't, there's no crunchy daikon radish. Like, there's definitely a timeline uh, of these plants. And that's why I don't plant a lot of mustard family plants, um, like mustard greens, I should say specifically, before the summer solstice. Cause they're like, oh, well, if I, maybe I'll just send up a flower stalk. And I see mustard greens for sale, like with flower stalks on them. Like, oh, that plant's like two weeks away from dying. Oh my gosh. So again, this is just kind of a, you know, a timing thing to make note of that beautiful green kale plant in the February garden. You can see all kinds of Brussels sprouts and stuff um, off behind that. Those kale plants, those Brussels sprout plants in March, you know, late March, early April, they were sending up flower stalks. Now, broccoli is a mustard family flower stalk. Like the flower stalks are delicious. So instead of eating Brussels sprouts, we just ate their flowers you know, like the way you would cook broccolini or like broccoli rob kind of stuff. And just walk around eating them and snacking on them and they make another great salad addition. Um, so just to think about kind of in terms of what latitude you're gardening at and how the plants respond to different day lengths is yet another cool variable to play with. Um, and all that kale and those Brussels sprouts down there, those were growing where I had my corn patch. So we had a big sweet corn patch, but in the midst of that sweet corn patch were a bunch of winter vegetables. And I'm gonna walk you through just how I did that in a couple of ways, just to give you an example of how we can blend the summer harvested plants with the winter harvested plants and get a little more mileage out of our space. 
Thank you. This is exciting. We do have a, a question in yeah. the, the chat, um, a couple of, of good prompts from Michelle. Thank you for sharing. So Michelle asks, can we adjust nitrogen to compensate for day length to possibly pos postpone plants um, from starting to flower? Yes. Um, that works better pre-solstice, I've found. Like, nobody can stop the spring happening, mm -hmm. kind of. You know, it's like, once the, once that day length is happening, once once that plant has been triggered to flower, it's like, you can't, you can't really hold them back. Um, more nitrogen in soil does tend to promote more leaf and cool spring soils don't have a lot of nitrogen. I'd say it'd be a great thing to experiment with like, who I'll give extra nitrogen to these four kale plants and I won't to that one and I'll see if those delay flowering. That'd be an awesome experiment with it I've never done. Um, I usually use it on the other side of the season when I'm starting plants and I give them a big old boost with nitrogen and keep them well watered and that that helps delay any bolting that might happen. I've totally noticed if there's a big hot day and oh my gosh, I didn't open up the greenhouse until 11 and like, oh, all the lettuce really is, you know, got too hot. It's much more prone to bolting after a hot dry day. That's not exactly nitrogen related, but definitely a factor that influences bolting. Let me know if you do that, Kate, like an experiment with it. I think that would be super cool. Definitely. If you if you do that, please email us <laughs> and we can we can talk about it. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, and for folks who are inspired too, there is another prompt. Uh, if we miss the timing, Michelle stated the chickens will happily help you eat up anything that's flowered. Yes. <laughs> rabbits too. In our last course, uh, Alexia mm -hmm. and Daniel showed us how to uh, homestead with rabbits and all the little spaces they've cultivated that kind of go over overboard for. Um, for you know, pleasant human consumption with arugula, the rabbits are on it. <laughs> the rabbits, yeah. We even just put the goats right into the kale pen, or I should say, we just grow a lot of food in the goat pens when the goats aren't in them, and then we just move the goats in. So yeah, I'll, I'll have a picture of that later too. Brilliant. <laughs> Okay, just a couple of snapshots of our fall garden. You can tell from the leaves on the trees that we're looking at kind of September. October here, last few leaves on the cascara tree there on the right. So we go into the winter with a pretty significant bunch of green things in the garden. Like, all right, we have a bunch of cabbages, we have a bunch of kale, it's a little unruly. Um, and at a certain point in the fall, what was a weed now becomes a cover crop. Uh, so plants like chickweed you know, I hoe it out pretty ruthlessly in the springtime, but if there's any around by the fall, I'm like, well, I'd rather go into the winter with an edible plant that's covering the soil than go into the winter with just bare soil. So <laughs> for what that's worth, I don't know if that's totally a sensible strategy, but just know that at different times of year, for me at least, what can be a weed in the spring becomes a cover crop in the fall, especially chickweed. So you'll see some chickweed growing through there, but plenty of lettuces, little baby cabbages, broccoli, kohlrabi, um, nice bundles of kale. And we just kind of graze our way through the green in the fall garden over the course of the winter. So a whole bunch grows in the summer faster than we can eat it. And then in the winter, we eat that down faster than it regrows. And then in the spring, we get another burst of growth. see Come on. i wanted to ask really quick to yeah. the the folks on do, are are people familiar with the practice of cover cropping um and if if there are any no's maybe we could uh speak to that um yeah. or i guess well might as well just speak to cover cropping it's a it's a, a way of of protecting your soil keeping nutrients in the ground cycling um through those those months that nothing's really productive on the farm um, or the garden. Um, not to say nothing, but, but you know, majority of the space would, would otherwise not have a productive plant growing in there for your consumption. And if you leave certain plants in the ground like vetch or rye, um, 
you, you know, you're getting all these nutrients that are being put into the soil over that time. Uh, erosion is not going to move your soil and, and gardening, you know, and having a productive garden comes back to the health of the soil. This is a really soil healthy practice. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I'll say a little more about cover crops at the end as actually not even at the end as we get through my planting calendar here. So this is just for folks who are like, tell me what to plant when, and I don't, I don't have time to get a territorial seed catalog. So this is just a rough, you know, a, a rough estimate of when I, in my garden in Woodenville, Washington, uh, plant some of these things. So in May, we're starting our cabbage. We're doing a first wave of kale, some of the longer variety uh, Brussels sprouts, another wave of broccoli. It's hard to grow too much broccoli. We really love it. Things like purple sprouting broccoli or the overwintering broccolis, things that say on the seed packet, you know, 240 days, like, well, you plant it in the summer and it goes all through the winter and you harvest it, uh, you know, in the following spring. Parsnips are another good one to do in May. They take, they take quite a while, but they're a fantastic winter food. And then here in June, we transplant out all the any seedlings who really need to go out. So we're putting out the cabbage sprouts and we're starting another wave of cabbage seedlings. So we kind of, we do multiple sowings of these. So we don't have everything happening at once. Well, especially because we only have five, five gallon sauerkraut crocs and we cannot fill them all with cabbage at the same time. We want the cabbage ripening in sequence. Then we do some other cool stuff like Gylon, Sprouting Broccoli, Purple Cauliflower, January King Cabbage. That's one that, boy, that cabbage can survive quite a snowstorm and still be good winter eating. Some more Brussels sprouts, that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, cabbage is a staple for us. In July, start getting a little more creative, throwing in some stuff like fennel, some of the fall kohlrabi. Maybe if I'm ambitious, I'll start some daikon radishes. I don't usually mind starting those a little later in August, though. Another wave of beets, kale, uh, winter carrots. I didn't put it on here. And throughout this process, I'm also doing, a, you know, a month's worth of greens. Every two months, or I'm sorry, every two weeks, I'll start another little tray of lettuce seedlings to be able to plunk those in wherever we want more, more lettuce. In August, along with the big main crop of daikon radish, because we're pulling out a lot of our earlier summer crops by August, I put in snap peas. Wow, is my life ever happier with two crops a year of snap peas? We can't grow them throughout the heat of the summer because of innation um, disease that gets to our most of our pea crop, but we're eating peas from May through June and into July. And then we plant more in August and we have, you know, probably by September, October, late September, mid-October, we're eating another big fall crop of snap peas for another several weeks. Uh, there's kohlrabi. If you haven't tried kohlrabi, it's pretty, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I showed one to some kids in the program once who said, oh yeah, that's a space radish. <laughs> that's what that is. Kohlrabi is space radish. It's like, Totally. It's basically like, if you can imagine a broccoli plant, but instead of flowers, it's been bred for a big bulbous stem. So that purple bulb, you peel off the any woody outer layer, um, depending on how big it gets. And then it's like this big, sweet, crunchy broccoli stem. If you can, if you can picture that, like just biting into it or grating it fresh for a salad or cutting it into slivers and dipping it in goat cheese. We are big fans of kohlrabi. Okay, in September, again, I'm putting in note a like multi month supply of lettuce now because it's not going to grow very fast in September, October, November. So I'm planting a lot more of these plants that we're going to nibble throughout the winter. Uh, and then, of course, if I forgot to plant anything, if I'm like, oh gosh, you know, I can totally put in another row of beets over there. Oh, are we going to have enough? enough carrots I'll go put some more in over there we just got some nice rain it'll be moist enough to germinate some some good fall carrots and then in September if I haven't planted them already I start doing some of those winter 
cover crops. Basically anywhere there's bare soil in my garden and I don't have a, you know, I haven't already planted something there. I say, hmm, well, if I leave it bare, it's going to get compacted soil by all the fall rains just drumming on it. And it's going to get weeds. So it might as well be weeds that I want there. So I plant uh, mustard greens, fava beans, oats. These are all crops that will go through the winter. If I had to choose just one cover crop, it might be crimson clover. You can see a picture of it there. When I was renting farmland, I planted three acres in crimson clover. It was so breathtakingly beautiful um, that I could hardly bear to, to, you know, disc it in, cut it down and disc it in. It's really a gorgeous plant that survived beautifully through the winter. And then by October, we're like, okay, last, you know, last chance on the lettuces and mustard greens that are happening in the greenhouse rye and fava beans for a cover crop. They're, they're really the hardy ones that will germinate even in October and you know start growing even really late in the season. If you're looking for an easy place to start, like easy place to start and feel success, you might wanna try putting in garlic in your garden. We plant it in October, pokes up, you know, the earlier varieties poke up December, January, February and then we harvest it in the summertime. So if you just want an entry point into like wrapping your mind around the idea of plants growing in your garden all year, take a couple of, you know, sprouting garlic cloves and put them in the soil. Garlic is very easy to grow. It's a little harder to grow like perfectly exquisite superlative garlic, but garlic itself is a very hardy plant. I've seen it, you know, popping up out of people's compost piles and stuff. Um, so even if you just want to grow it for the greens that shoot up to have a nice garlic flavored green, kind of using it like a green onion, that's, you know, a great way to have something growing in your garden all winter long. I'm going to also point you towards one of our favorite techniques, which is growing soil sprouts indoors. And the reference I've used for that is a book called Year Round Indoor Salad Gardening by Peter Burke. And we just plant trays with soil and soaked pea seeds in them. We can grow them in the windowsill inside. And that gives us a beautiful carpet of fresh pea shoots. Because believe me, we are eating a lot of cabbage and spicy mustard greens for a couple of weeks there in the winter. And if we can tame that with some really sweet, juicy pea shoots, um, that gets more salad into everybody. So just contemplate that because it's also something you can do on a windowsill in an apartment. You don't need, you know, 200 square feet to grow a whole bunch of cabbage. You can grow pea shoots in your windowsill quite successfully. Okay, that is the fall planting, kind of the summer and fall planting calendar, broad brush strokes, just to give you some ideas about what we do. And I, yes, I love me some garlic. It's all the soft neck garlic we grow. Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a couple questions in the chat. Um, one is celery, does that make a good winter crop? Yeah, it does. I've had it just cruise right on through the winter. Last year was the first year that I started experimenting with celery. So I'm no expert, uh, but I can say that it did hold on really well all winter for me. And if I'd had it in a greenhouse, it probably would have been even more enthusiastic about growing. Uh, it was, it's a little easier to grow leaf celery than like big, juicy, crunchy stalks. So again, it's kind of like garlic. It's an easy plant to grow. It's a little harder to get it to grow just like the ones you see in the supermarket. You're going to have to adjust some things. Celery can be pretty finicky, I've discovered. Finicky about germinating, finicky about where it grows. Um, but totally worth experimenting with and very hardy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great mm -hmm. questions also, Michelle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then Yun was wondering um, if, if I could type in the name of the book again, that does sound oh. fantastic. Indoor salad gardening? Is that? Year round indoor salad gardening. There it is. Year round mm -hmm. indoor salad gardening. Oh, perfect, by Peter Burke. Okay, I will type that into the chat too. And then uh, I agree with the second comment. Great photo view with that garlic. That <laughs> is just pure joy. 
such an incredible reward for all of your wonderful planning and hard work. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's right. You and I have weeded that garlic patch, Pat, <laughs> so it's looking good. Oh, yay. It was a pleasure. I have, I want to come out again very soon too. Yeah. More reading. <laughs> yeah. um, so just a note on soil blocks, because it's kind of like, okay, well, yes, winter gardening is great, but how do I do it? So the technique that's been the most helpful for me is using soil blocks because I have an acre plus of gardens spread out over multiple acres that I'm running around and checking. So it's hard for me to lavish care on little tiny seedling over here and a little tiny seedling over there. And, you know, if we get a hot day, how many trips do I need to make with the hose or the watering can? So I have been using soil blocks and I got my soil blocks from Johnny's Selected Seeds just the the tool that makes the little mud pies basically and you know that's also in the seed starting course that we did through 21 acres uh you could use a little yogurt cup you know you could use all kinds of things to just start a few plants pretty basic concept it's been used in lots of places around the world make a block of soil put a little seed in it you can hover over this it's a lot easier for me to water all these cabbage seedlings right in there than it is for me to run around and water them in lots of different places. And then it just gives me um, this art project, like all the different vegetables are colors and I can go kind of plug them into the garden and do this whole kind of paint by numbers thing, you know, of like putting in different plants where they're going to do well. And the plants are already established. They're already ready to go. I have to move them. Like they can't live in a little cube of soil forever. But it's, uh, it's, it's really helped kind of plug in little baby seedlings wherever, wherever I want them to go. You can see me there with a little tiny spinach. You know, we, I just got that seedling germinated. I didn't need to do a whole bunch else to it. It's in one of the small size cubes. And over on the left are the larger size cubes that we use for larger seeds or if we're doing multi seeds in one block. I'll give you more resources about those too. Okay, so soil blocks. Just wanted to tell you about that before we go on to the corn example, which is going to make it a little more exciting. Oh yeah, you can tell. So there I am lavishing care on hundreds of tiny seedlings. You can tell it's in the winter because that's what I look like in the winter in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, so here are some photographic examples like of what does this look like to grow winter veggies in, in this example, a corn patch. It could be other things. This is, this is just my example of how I've worked this in. So there I am direct sowing corn. I'm actually walking along, putting corn seeds in a row in the ground and stepping on them. Uh, and that corn is going to grow. There might be places where it doesn't grow, you know, mold tunneled underneath it. The seed wasn't good, who knows? there are probably going to be gaps in that corn row. I might make gaps. I might be thinning plants and have an awkward spacing in between plants where I'm like, oh, it's not quite, you know, there's, there's some space here. There's some unused space. Well, there's our friend Wendy planting little tiny kale seeds in soil blocks. Or maybe she's planting cabbage or beets or celery, some winter hardy vegetable that's going to last once the corn is gone, because that corn is going to be done in October, but not all is lost. There are going to be plenty of plants that can survive through the winter. So there's a little tiny soil blocker that makes those cute little brownie bite soil cubes. We're getting little seeds into those cubes in the hoop house. They're going to be ready to plunk in wherever there's a gap in the row. So here's a little aerial view of that popcorn patch. Let's say I've got some corn, you know, I ran around, I was so excited to plant corn, I plant a bunch of corn in May. And in mid-May, I see some corn coming up, but some spots where there isn't corn. Oh no, but there's still time for corn to ripen. I plant some more corn. By the time June rolls around, any corn that's not up, I'm like, you know, tough luck. I missed my window for planting corn that's going to ripen in my microclimate. So I am going to find any remaining gaps in my corn and I'll put in those little baby kale that we started in mid-May. Uh, 
or kohlrabi or cabbage, whatever it might be. So those plants are going to kind of languish there in the shade of the corn plants all summer. You're like, wow, they don't look very good. But you get a couple of good solid rains and the corn starts to die back and all of a sudden that kale's like, yeah, here I go. I mean, the cabbage might not be as giant as if you grew it just out on its own away from other plants, but it's still gonna be a usable head of cabbage. Uh, and the kale is just going to be rocking. Brussels sprouts are going to pop right up in there. Kohlrabi is going to be, you know, just gathering sunlight and making a tasty root or a tasty bulb, uh, bulb stem. So by the time the uh, corn dies back, we are, you know, eating kale leaves. We're able to eat those winter vegetables that have grown up right alongside the corn and are just ready to go once the corn dies back. That's what it looks like wow. in the winter time. This is a you know snowy winter day. Go brush that snow off of that cabbage, take it inside and make coleslaw. And you can see the corn stalks growing around it um, that we left up as bird perches. <laughs> That's one way we get our garden fertilized. In the winter time, the birds come perch on there and hop around and give us phosphorus, which is very generous of them. And um, yeah, that's what it looks like. And we just kind of knock down those corn stalks and plant in the spring. That's the corn example. Any questions come up about that? I am just in awe of um, your guys' understanding of every functioning organism's ability to, to help us all get where we need to go and survive. And um, just the resourcefulness of, of it all is, is really, really inspiring. Now, <laughs> this is just kind of random. Um, I'm having so much trouble with corn at my house. I did okay last year direct sowing, but this year I think squirrels moved in and I will... <laughs> I've been, I, I've made my own, like I have four more little corn starts. I had 20, but now we've got four. Oh. And I'm wondering if you have any tricks on germinating corn without animals getting into it, or is it just something I have to chuck up to a, to feeding, feeding my friends? <laughs> For this year, probably. I fed them. Okay. That's good. Yeah. This, this <laughs> year you have fed them, but you can plant some kale and kohlrabi. <laughs> and I absolutely, now so, I'm inspired to do that. I will. Yes, all is not lost. Yeah, I'm, yeah, corn is a slightly narrow window, depending on the variety you're growing. I mean, you could, you, depending on how experimental you want to be, um, it really depends on your gardening goals. But yeah, it's, it's a bit of a trick. I have wept so vigorously. <laughs> You know, coming home one day and finding hundreds of dead corn plants like that were fine in the morning. Yeah. Like I've wept so vigorously that the neighbor actually came out of her house to console me. She was like, <laughs> I heard some weeping and wailing out here. I'm like, I know my corn. But we replanted and it was okay, but it was still like May. So um yeah, so starting early too. I, I kind of started at the end of May and I think I should have started a bit earlier just to give me some time to prepare. Um, it is painful. And yep. I'm like at the end of the day, okay, you, I will figure it out next year. Uh, <laughs> and okay, one more question came up um, for cabbage. Are you direct sowing at this time or is this also a soil block? Um, great. Great. I'm pretty much a, I'm pretty much a soil block gal um, because I just know that I'm lazy. And if I've planted seeds far out, I'm just not going to check on them. Mm -hmm. Now for some plants that works fine. Like I'll go out to distant compost piles and I just stuff a bunch of squash seeds in there and I just loosen up the soil and throw in a tomato plant and I just walk away. And then I just come back and harvest if anything grew. But that's a pretty good return on investment. It's like higher risk, but anything that does come up is like free food. Yeah. Uh, but cabbage are a little more finicky and they're super important to us. So I start them in soil blocks and fuss over them to give them a good start. Um, so it really just depends on the plant and what you're willing to risk out there. Everything's worth a try. I mean, if you're feeling experimental, you know, there, there are very few hard and fast like 
you know, one way or another. There's hardly anything that hasn't ever worked for anybody anywhere <laughs> in terms of gardening. Exactly. But yeah, I, I start all of these in soil blocks. And I don't think this is a January King cabbage, but if you're looking for a cabbage that will get through the winter, January King might not always, it's not always the most delicious cabbage um, or it can get a little tough, but that's what makes it get through the winter too. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Those different, the difference in taste definitely translates to their, uh, what they're doing through the, the heat, the, the daylight, all of that. Yes. Uh, actually, speaking of cabbage varieties, here you see three different varieties growing in big row, and they have to be hardened off properly to get through the winter. Perhaps the weather will naturally do this for you and just give you mild frosts at first and get, you know, progressively more and more frosty uh, for the plants to build up those sugars in their tissues and be able to resist frost. We had one year where it was warm, 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 warm all through October. And then suddenly we had this 20 degree plunge and all my kale that would be able to survive a 20 degree temperature um, just shriveled up and died, it be, just froze because it hadn't had enough time to acclimate. So even just running out there with a bed sheet, you know, will provide a lot of extra cover uh, and keep the frost off of those plants, at least for the first couple. So again, depends on you know how much effort you want to expend for the amount of food you're going to get. Um, and in general, purple cabbage resist freezing better than green cabbage. I've totally come out and seen like the green cabbage are kind of funky and slimy after a frost and the red cabbage have a lot more edible material in them. So uh, also savoid leaves, the kind of crinkly cabbage supposed to be a little more cold hardy. And there are lots of factors. Coming back to the nitrogen point, if you give your plants a lot of nitrogen in the fall, yes, they might grow big, but they're not gonna be very frost hardy. Nitrogen promotes a lot of lush, loose growth that is susceptible to frost damage. So I, you know, I might put some extra compost on or around a plant like cabbage, but maybe more as a mulch type of thing. Um, rather than really trying to get the plants to grow with heavy nitrogen. Do, do, do. Oh yes, and the Johnny Selected Seed Territorial Catalog have lots of great growing info per plant. The Elliott Coleman books, like the one I mentioned, the Winter Harvest Handbook has great tips and techniques about how to cover plants to get the maximum benefit for frost protection. Like I said, you know, a, a bed sheet, if you've got nothing else, will keep your plants a lot warmer on a winter night. These cabbages are hybrid cabbages where I pretty much get a big, beautiful head of cabbage for every seed I buy. A lot of the um, kind of hardware store seed rack stuff is not necessarily very uniform quality seed. I've planted it, you know, like, oh, I'm out of cabbage seed. I'll just run down and grab a package and I'll get some that make nice heads, most of them don't. Um, so just a little cautionary note there that if you get weird results from your seeds, it might be that the seed is pretty funky. And I, especially for a crop like cabbage, I'd usually just get a good hybrid and I'm quite happy with the results. But suit yourself and your gardening preferences. Just wanted to give you a heads up to get good seed. Okay. All right, moving in just a little bit here about some more winter protection. So this is one of our goat pens that also does duty as a garden. We grew onions here in the summertime. We pulled up the onions in August and then planted a whole bunch of kale and Brussels sprout um, seedlings. And in November, you could not see the ground in there. Like it was just jam packed with leaves and we were crawling around harvesting Brussels sprouts and eating kale out of there for months. And in the background, you can kind of see how we just like ate our way through the patch. In the background, you see these metal hoops here when it was really cold or you know, there's heavy snow and I was worried about the heavy Brussels sprout stalks. I just stick those metal stakes, uh, hoops 
over the rose and then you can see the plastic there in the background just like drape some plastic over it didn't have to be super tight just had to keep the you know the main chill off of them um, and it's worked out worked out just great doesn't take much to protect these cold hardy crops and next up this is a quick hoop there over some kale plants that were growing in the fall and those are like four foot tall kale plants happily growing in the snow we just walk in there and you know gather a whole bunch of lacinato kale for a nice you know chop it up fine with some garlic and some balsamic vinegar and olive oil and you know great vitamins for the winter and here's another style of hoop house again you can see that we make liberal use of these cattle panels or hog panels and growing spicy green mustards they're a little spicy for me they get a lot tamer when they're cooked but again spicy plants tend to resist the cold a little better that's been my experience yeah so you see there's a bunch of chard there a bunch of lettuce um, endive and some big green mustards with little tiny ones coming up there to keep growing as we eat our way through the rest of our greens in this hoop house you don't need cover to grow uh winter vegetables you know obviously we have lots of stuff that grows out there without cover and you just take what you can get but if you have any way to provide a little extra cover even if it is that uh, clear plastic cake plate over over your your little row of lettuce you'll, you'll get some good mileage out of it i've really enjoyed gardening in a greenhouse and there was something when i came to visit you on the the homestead something you shared was um just made a lot of sense to me is there were areas that you planted lettuce or kale or, or chard in the shade mm -hmm. just a little bit so we can maximize their growing time too and i did not do that this year so <laughs> next year <laughs> i've got some flowers that maybe I'll harvest the seeds from. They're just, they're just hanging out in there. <laughs> but shade next time. Yeah, I know. Like I'm always trying to, in the Pacific Northwest, scrounge for every little bit of available sunlight. Right. But a lot of the lettuces will grow just fine. You know, chard will grow fine. I grow it around our fruit trees. Um, mustards will be a little less intensely spicy if we grow them with a little more shade. So there's way a way to make use of all the space in the garden. Awesome. And just for one more little time check, we're at 1.55. Oh my gosh, okay, we are, uh, we are getting down to the end here. So for our kids programs, I try to send somebody, send everybody home with some kind of, um, some kind of produce from the garden. <laughs> and at a certain point, the kids started looking alarmed when I would suggest harvesting more cabbage you're like my mom said to not bring home any more cabbage um i would rather have rather have a little more than than a little less yeah so and just another plug for cover crops the kids there on the right are standing in that goat pen that you saw earlier this is in a different year and it's got chickweed it's got kale it's got mustard greens it's got arugula and they are snacking on the cover crops um so you can grow cover crops and eat them too. This is basically just a whole bunch of cheap kale seed, you know, kale seed that we gathered from our plants mm -hmm. and mustard seed that we gathered from our plants and we sprinkled it around and we had a beautiful crop that was protecting the soil through the winter and gave us some good snacking too. And then we put the goats in there and the goats polished off anything we didn't want to eat. So that worked out just fine. Okay, and after all that cabbage, you know that spring will come again and spring makes the winter worth it. It's like such a satisfying feeling to, to know that we got through another winter and that spring is on the way. So that's a really exciting time of year. Um, the cabbage is starting to, we're getting a little tired of coleslaws um, and stir fried cabbage by the time March rolls around, but that's when our new greens are kicking in. So it's all part of the great roller coaster ride of the solar year and the gardener's year up here in the Pacific Northwest. Yay! Oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. And here are more resources. I'll leave this slide up for a while. Um, yeah, Binda Colebrook's uh, Winter Gardening in the Maritime Northwest is like a classic for sure. And really 
credit her for getting a lot of the winter gardening ball rolling up here. And um, Steve Solomon's always a great thing. Uh, great writer as well. Elliot Coleman is like the winter garden guy. He gardens in Maine. So yeah, and feel free to look us up at hawthornfarm.org. Um, Although these are all great resources. If you look into these, you'll be well on the way to getting your winter garden planted and enjoyed. Oh, thank you so much, Alexia. This all in the expertise of all of these, these brilliant people, you know, paving the way for us to be um, ahead of the game and, and kind of, you know, returning to the way um, food sovereignty was. And this is just fantastic. 